emotional intelligence, which is sometimes called your EQ, so as opposed to your IQ, which is your, your intellectual quotient, um, your emotional quotient, your emotional intelligence is your EQ, and it's, sometimes it's called EI, and sometimes it's called EIQ. So emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is the ability to interpret your emotions, which we know means many things, strategically. And in the actual definition of emotional management, um, the word is accurately, but emotions aren't really a matter of accuracy, they're a matter of effective choices. So I say the ability to interpret emotions strategically. And then to use that information to manage your emotions, communicate them competently, and solve relationship problems. So people with high emotional intelligence tend to have four skills. So these are sort of my version of the, of the four basic skills of emotional intelligence. One, they have an acute or strong understanding of their own affect emotions, feelings, and moods. And that means the ability to recognize affective states and describe them neutrally, to label those affective states strategically and intentionally for a purpose, um, and then awareness of what the particular labels mean. So thought cues, needs, physical effects. So I know when I feel X, Y, Z, um, I'm going to interpret that as boredom. And when that happens, these are the things I'm going to respond with and these are how I'm going to manage it. So the acute understanding of your own emotions, which includes affect emotions, thought, feelings, and moods. Okay. Two, the ability to have a sense of um, others, so an understanding of others' emotions, what we usually call empathy, the ability to see things from others' perspectives and to have a sense of compassion regarding how they're perceiving a situation. So something that may not upset you may upset someone else, and then your just ability to kind of be okay with the fact that something is upsetting to someone else that's not upsetting to you. Number three is an aptitude or talent for constructively managing your own emotions, labeling, um, choosing which states you want to experience, that kind of stuff. So managing your own emotions is step three. And then step four is emotional problem solving. So the capacity for harnessing your emotional state in ways that create competent decision making, communication, and relationship problem solving. So understanding your own emotions, understanding others' emotions, managing your own emotions, and emotional problem solving. You will notice that one of the phases is not managing others' emotions, right? You understand your own, you understand theirs, you manage yours, but you're not responsible for managing other people's emotions. So um, nowhere is, are you considered emotionally intelligent or not. It, uh, if you are operating under the illusion, you can manage other people's emotions. The only person who can manage their emotion is the person experiencing the emotion, right? So that's not part of the deal. Given that emotional intelligence involves understanding emotions coupled with the ability to manage them in ways that optimize your interpersonal communication competence, it's not surprising that people with high emotional intelligence experience a broad range of positive outcomes. So the reason I'm telling you this is because I think we have a bad habit um, in our culture specifically of kind of assuming that emotions are this thing that we just kind of don't want. So we don't want emotions in the workplace or we don't want emotion. We don't want you to be too emotional in a relationship. But you're always emotional. I'm emotional right now. We're emotional in class. You're emotional at work. Emotion doesn't mean dramatic. It doesn't mean crying. It doesn't mean acting out. It doesn't mean anger, right? Those are very intense, acute emotions. But there's all kinds of ways that your thought feelings and your moods and your affective states and your emotions enter into your daily life. So you're always managing emotions. It's just you're more comfortable and recognize certain emotions as safe and appropriate and not others. But all of them are perfectly legitimate. I mean, should you laugh out hysterically in the middle of a funeral? It depends. I mean, maybe that's the choice you've made. You might get judged for it, but that doesn't mean it's the wrong choice. It, it depends. So the only reason I'm telling you this is because if you have a resistance to emotional intelligence as a skill that you wish to acquire, perhaps knowing the positive benefits that people experience from having good emotional intelligence will make you more inclined toward learning to manage your emotions instead of being a person who just says, well, I just don't get emotional, which is not true. Um, you get certain types of emotional that you recognize as rational, but that's just your interpretation. So um, within leadership positions, people with high emotional intelligence are more likely than low emotional intelligence people to get trust, to inspire followers, and be perceived as having integrity. High emotionally intelligent individuals are less likely than low EQ people to bully people or use violence, right? So that's another reason if you tend to be sort of a little bit coercive or a little bit of a bully, emotional intelligence might be something you could develop that would curb that. 
people with high EQ find it easier to forgive relational partners who have wronged them because of their strong empathy and skill at emotion management. So they tend to experience um, less dramatic relationships, relationships that aren't as jealous, as uh, stressful. Um, high emotionally intelligent people have the ability to harness the power of positive emotions, savoring positive emotions rather than dampening them, thus benefiting in their overall life satisfaction. Um, so what we're talking about here is we're not talking about like feel positive emotions all the time. High emotional intelligence also means that you are very well adjusted and very accepting of the fact that a lot of the time you are just going to experience low level emotional states in your life. Boredom, disappointment, uncertainty, restlessness, indeterminacy, that's a lot of your life and people with high emotional intelligence don't try to just make everything positive. That would be not effective. They're also good at sitting with non-positive emotions, but when they have positive emotions or positive experiences, they do try to really garner that stuff, right? They try to work it up, they try to remember it, they try to make sense of it, um, as opposed to people with low emotional intelligence who very often will have a positive experience, but they won't work to try to hold on to it, to try to uh, concretize it, to try to put it into memory. And again, that doesn't mean you're always positive. It just means that you work hard to try to bring more positivity and and recognize and value positivity when it happens instead of just dismissing it doesn't mean you're just always positive. Well, let's suppose that the FEMA model flies on by you and suddenly you just find yourself sad or you find yourself excited or you find yourself angry and you got there kind of fast and you didn't have time to sort of reframe it in the beginning, you're already there. So one strategy for managing emotions is to try to modify or control them after you become aware that they've happened. An event triggers arousal, you interpret the event, you become aware of an emotion, you display the emotion, right? You experience the heightened intensity of the emotion. And then you might consciously try to modify your internal experience and outward communication of that emotion. And the two most common ways people manage emotion after they have been triggered are suppression and venting. Spoiler alert, these are both going to turn out not to be super ideal, but they happen a lot. So we want to know what they are and have names for them so we can recognize them. But ultimately, these are not going to be two strategies you want to hold on to. So suppression involves inhibiting thoughts, arousal, and outward behavioral displays of emotion, uh, basically dampening, right? So trying to keep yourself from expressing it, talking yourself down, white knuckling and telling yourself it's not okay to feel this way. The desire to, su to suppress stems from the recognition that a feeling or an emotion, uh, communicating that emotion, thinking it, would be relationally, culturally, or socially inappropriate according to the norms of you know whatever situation you're in. Um, although people sometimes suppress positive emotions, so for example, if you're out to dinner and uh, you're really excited about something and somebody else is clearly not in the mood, you might suppress to kind of keep that stuff away. Suppression more often occurs with negative emotions, especially anger and sadness. This is because displays of pleasant emotions typically tend to elicit favorable responses, whereas negative emotions drive other people away. Um, that's not always true, though, because, for example, one thing I've noticed is that pride can be an emotion that people suppress. So if you, I don't know, get uh, good news about a grade or you get into a program that you were really excited about or you ate really healthy that day or, I don't know, just something is going well, I do find that a lot of times people are afraid to brag on that because they're gonna be perceived as narcissistic or conceited or stuck up. But the kind of person who is worried about bragging on themselves, coming across as conceited, is not the kind of person that has to worry about coming across as conceited. So one of the issues with suppression is a lot of times what we're doing is we're suppressing positive emotions that, would, that we should be practicing like ginning up and drumming up to try to feel those a lot. Like we should feel pride and contentment and satisfaction and personal intelligence and self-worth, right? We should feel those things a lot. Um, but a lot of times they'll they'll sneak up on us and we're afraid to display them outwardly because of what other people might think. And so we, we shove them back down. There's this thing called the, it's like, it's called like the crab mentality. So there's this legend that, and I think it's true, I think people have seen this happen, that when fishermen are catching crabs, they have to put them in a really tall pot because the crabs will jump into the pot. And once you get enough crabs in there, they'll instinctively know to pile up into a pile, and then as you know, new crabs top on top, eventually you get the pile tall enough that one of the crabs can jump out of the top. 
But what'll happen is occasionally as the crabs are stacking up on top of each other in the top of the pot, trying to get to the top of the pot, occasionally you'll get a crab that scoots up the side of the pot and the fish and the, the crabs in the center will actually grab the other crab by the leg and yank it back down into, into the pot. And so, and I think that's a good metaphor for how a lot of times we think people are going to receive our positive emotions, which is why we suppress them. Um, but suppression is very widely practiced as a strategy for managing unavoidable or unwanted negative emotions. Um, but of course, its effectiveness is sort of marginal because you are trying to modify an intense arousal that you're already experiencing, or maybe you've been in a mood for two days. You don't want to try to manage the mood after it's sunk in. The inverse of suppression is venting. Venting is allowing emotions to dominate your thoughts and then explosively expressing them. You're sort of fanning the flame of emotional arousal. So if suppression is, is dampening the flame, um, venting is fanning the flame. Venting could be positive, like when you jump up in for joy because you got a, you know, yeah, I got a promotion or whatever. Um, but that, but nobody has a problem with that, right? That's just celebration. The issue is when you vent negative emotions, particularly anger, because it just, it's not effective because the venting can keep you in the cycle of focusing, right? In some ways you're actually reaffirming. So we think that when we talk about stuff a lot, it's going to get it out of our system. It depends. If as you're venting about it, it, it changes so that you can think about it in a different way, it might be helpful for emotional management. But more often than not, what happens is as we're venting, we just keep re-upping our investment in the slight, right? We keep thinking about the hurt, we keep revisiting the trauma, we keep revisiting the dramatic issue, and we're not getting any resolution, we're just reaffirming it in our mind, convincing ourselves that our anger is justified, right? So we're not looking at maybe how we misunderstood the situation or maybe the, how there are other perspectives. We're just continuing to think about how our perspective is right. Um, the reason people think venting works is because eventually somebody like burns themselves out and then they're tired. So that does work, but it's not the venting that made you less angry. It's the fact that you used up so much emotional energy to do the venting that you just get exhausted. And then you're too exhausted to worry as much about it anymore. Because like, like we talked about, emotions are higher intensity states, so they can't last as long. And so if you're venting about an emotion, eventually you are going to burn out the emotion, but not because the venting has somehow gotten the bad out of you, um, but because you just got too tired. And so it, but the next, but once you like get some rest, the next time something shitty happens, you're going to start all over again because all the venting did was continue to affirm that you were right and that your judgment of the situation was the best one and that you should be angry and that you are entitled to all this anger. But then you eventually just got tired, but you never resolved or came up with another way of thinking about it. And so you just create a cycle where this is now all you're able to do. Anger is a negative emotion that occurs when you, one, believe you are entitled to something, right? You should get this goal. Two, that goal is interrupted or blocked. And three, it's interrupted or blocked by the improper action of an external agent. So in other words, I was supposed to get this promotion. That guy who didn't deserve it swooped in and stole it from under me. I'm angry because that shit should have been mine and they didn't deserve it, right? So as the definition suggests, anger is almost always triggered by someone or something external to us and our perception that what they did is unfair. It requires entitlement because something can't be unfair to you unless you thought that what was fair was you getting what you want. And that's where, and so that's where anger gets really tricky because number one, you're rarely entitled to as much stuff as you think you're entitled to. And two, the explanation that you didn't get the thing you're supposed to get because someone else came and took it away from you or kept you from getting it is so clearly a fundamental attribution error because there could be a million reasons why things didn't work out the way you want. And that is a moment where experiencing a much lower level state of emotion like disappointment, right? I wanted a thing. It would have been nice if I got the thing. I really, really wanted it. I didn't. It sucks, right? That's that's all there is to that particular experience. Turning it into anger, though, lets you blame somebody else for things not having gone wrong instead of you having to think about, like, well, this was, you know, never mine to begin with, and life is sometimes just random chance. There is some debate about whether, like, punching a pillow or whatever works. It depends. If you are a person who typically has not been taught that your anger is justified, yes, punching the pillow works for you because it helps you process, not vent out, but process the fact that you do have anger that you need to face. 
if you are a person who's already quick to anger, no, punching a pillow will not help because you're just continuing to sit there thinking it's unfair, right? The only thing that fixes this is you working through the definition of anger, right? Okay, right now I feel anger because one, I felt entitled to something. Okay, were you entitled to that thing? Are you entitled to a promotion? Are you entitled to a nicer office? Were you entitled to the parking space? I mean, whatever it was, right? Were you entitled for somebody to just stay with you for the rest of your life and commit to you and never break up with you? I mean, no, it would have been nice. You hope that's what's gonna happen, but you're not entitled to it. Then did the other person do it on purpose to fuck with you, right? And three, was it unfair or improper for them to have done it? No, they broke up with me and it sucks. And I don't know that I like deserved the way it happened and I tried really hard to be a good partner, but romance isn't a matter of entitlement. I just wanted the relationship. I liked being with the person. I'm used to them if I'm being honest. And now they're not there anymore and I'm disappointed and it sucks. But anger is a choice, right? That comes through a series of specific things that you are thinking are true about a situation that are definitely your perception. Um, okay, so that's anger. So while venting does provide a temporary sense of pleasure because you feel righteous and validated, uh, it boosts anger. So then there's this other thing, because not all of you experience anger. But if you don't experience anger, you do experience, I bet frequently, this other emotion, this emotion called anger light that I call anger light. And this is called resentment. Um, and if you haven't experienced anger recently, I bet you'll recognize that you uh, have experienced resentment, especially if you're a nice person or a people pleaser, if you identify that way. A lot of what's happening when people are people pleasing is they are being nice on the outside and saying yes when they want to say no or saying no, right? They're doing things they don't feel like doing, but then the inside, they're not being nice at all, right? The inside, they're talking shit, they're blaming people, right? That's resentment. So the definition of resentment is bitter indignation. And indignation is like, it's like baby entitlement, right? The bitter indignation at having been treated unfairly. So similar to anger, because there's this sense of unfairness, there's this sense of righteous injustice, there's this sense of like, that wasn't supposed to happen, but it's all kind of toned down. That's why a lot of us feel resentment on so many levels, because since it's not a blown up gigantic emotion, it's, it's a little bit of a more moderate emotion. We don't pay as much attention to it. Um, it's also known as bitterness. And it is the basic foundation of hatred. It also involves um, some feelings of disgust, sadness, and surprise because you ha kind of have this perception that you have been wronged somehow. All right. Resentment also depends on the perception that someone was supposed to do something or you were supposed to get something you didn't get. Uh, I've heard resentment described as drinking poison and expecting the other person to die because while you are on the outside acting as if everything's okay, unlike a person who has anger who doesn't, on the inside, you're essentially just keeping all of the anger inside while you pretend on the outside to be nice, right? That's kind of the key to resentment. Because if you were resentful on the outside, which you can be in passive aggressive ways, uh, most people aren't comfortable doing that, so they keep the resentment inside. When you routinely practice resentment, so I'm talking like when your dominant trait, like you go to resentment a lot to try to process negative emotions, um, that it becomes almost part of your self-concept, either for your ideal or actual self. We describe that condition of perpetual resentment as martyrdom. In theology and history, martyrs are specific historical figures who sacrifice themselves for like worthy causes, right, for social justice. Think of Joan of Arc, um, and then there's the self-immolating monk during the Vietnam War. We talk about making people martyrs because they're murdered or assassinated because of something they stand for, so Martin Luther King, uh, John F. Kennedy, um, like it's, you know, it's debatable with people like Michael Brown, for example, um, or Eric Garner are martyrs. They have been martyred, but since they themselves did not die in pursuit of a specific cause, it, that's kind of like gray area. But generally speaking, martyrs sacrifice themselves for the greater good, right? The difference between those kinds of martyrs and interpersonal communication martyrs or martyrdom because I don't know if you really want to call yourself, I'm a martyr. I don't think that that's good for you, but you can say like, I have habits of practicing martyrdom, right? I tend, I tend to have a lot of martyrdom in my communication. Um, your sense of sacrifice, you're like always being worn out and always doing what everyone else wants to do and always putting your stuff aside so other people can be happy. It doesn't come from a place of acceptance and empowerment and working toward change. It comes from a place of you being not brave enough to tell people like, I just don't want to do this right? You're afraid of what people are going to say or do or think about you if you stand up for yourself. So you just keep continuing to do things you don't want to do and then making yourself, and then of course, like your brain's like, why are we doing all this stuff we don't want to do? 
this is, doesn't make any sense, right? So you explain it to yourself by being like, well, because I'm self-sacrificing. If I don't do it, no one else would do it. If I didn't do it, uh, you know, it wouldn't get done. And people just don't appreciate me. And you start to feel a kind of pleasure because you're so put upon and you're so stressed and you do everything for everyone else. And so you start to become kind of proud of the fact that you suffer the most. And that's really, really addictive to, to be the person who suffers the most. It's just like anger. If you practice it enough, it becomes a very addictive feeling and the thoughts trigger a really positive, not in the sense of like effective, but in the sense of you get rewarded with your body flooding itself with all kinds of chemicals to reward that behavior because it's now become a habit. You gotta work really hard to break that cycle, okay? Because being resentful all the time and being angry are two very shitty ways to live your life. One, victim mentality. You see or describe yourself uh, as a victim. Although you may have endured some bad relationships or bad experiences where people were in fact jerks, you don't own how you create or promote or allow these outcomes, right? So bad stuff might've happened, but you don't own how you now have a choice to not repeat those cycles. It feels inevitable that just like, oh, my life has always sucked, it'll just keep sucking. You have a hard time owning your role and problems when you discuss them, rather than saying next time I am going to blank, right? Owning your role and what you can do, you say, uh, oh, they should have done it differently or they're gonna have to change or why should I have to change? You reject or refuse to look for solutions. So if someone, uh, you, if you're complaining to someone and they offer you a suggestion, your first, reject, your first instinct is to just reject it, right? It's not gonna work, I don't have time for that, whatever. Following this, you might find that you rationalize or justify why you must continue to behave in the way you're behaving. I gotta keep working on this person's paper because if I don't, then blah, 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 right? Like, I'm looking at you going, you don't have to do other people's homework. You don't have to give other people your notes. You don't have to stay up with people while you're tired. I mean, these are all choices you make and they are optional. And you're looking at me going, oh, but I have to do those things, right? That's a really good sign that you're, you've got some martyrdom communication going on. Uh, you also may behave as if you're trapped, even when some of your pro problems have obvious solutions. Trapped people often fluctuate between acting helpless and lashing out. So sometimes anger and martyrdom can work together because when you're being a martyr, you're repressing your feelings, you're acting in resentment, and eventually it gets too much so you get angry. And then you feel bad you got angry and you go back to resentment. That's called the reactive conflict sequence and it's a combination of anger and martyrdom. Sign number one, victim mentality. Sign two, rejecting uh, possible solutions. Sign three, you communicate with people who can't make changes. We call these non-agential communicators. They're communicators who don't have agency. So uh, you and your romantic partner are having trouble. You talk to, about, to everyone about it but your romantic partner and you tell yourself, oh, they won't listen to me or, oh, well, you know, they, they don't want to hear what I have to say. I mean, in reality, what you're doing is you're rejecting solutions because you're going to people who can't fix the problem to solve a problem. And then fourth, you seek a change in circumstance, not a change in perception. So instead of changing how you think about things, you want other people to change. You want the situation to change. There's also this shorthand process that I think like if you're in a real pinch, this is a really easy way to work on changing emotional management and it's called reappraisal. So while your CTFAR and ABCDE models are your best steps, they're longer. Um, they require a little bit more effort, but the reappraisal you can do them pretty fast. It's two steps and they go in, they have to go in this order. So you can't flip them first. Before or like at the start of an encounter where you suspect it'll trigger an undesired emotion or you kind of have been through this before and you know it always doesn't go well for you, call to mind the positive aspects of the encounter, right, of the event that, that might make you upset. If you truly can't think of anything positive about whatever's happening, um, the person, the relationship, whatever, focus on like, oh, um, one positive thing that could happen out of this is I could practice being the kind of person who doesn't just feel an emotion because I thought it. Like I can be the kind of person who gets to choose how I react to things. I don't have to just do whatever my brain tells me to do, right? Or I can be the kind of person who can have a perfectly decent conversation with someone that I don't like. So that's the positive aspects of the encounter. And this is really hard to do. I mean, nobody wants to go into a shitty situation and be like, well, this is an opportunity for me to get used to dealing with shitty situations. But if you can't come up with anything else, that is a shortcut. Then once you have called to mind what potentially positive aspects there are of the encounter, consider the short and long-term consequences of your actions. So if you withdraw right now, if you hide, if you refuse to talk to this person, um, what are the short-term and long-term consequences? So in the immediate, you'll get some relief, but in the long-term, you're probably gonna make the problem worse, maybe. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes withdrawal is fine. It just sort of depends. If I lash out right now and quit my job, 
you know, short, long-term consequences. So it's real fast. It's uh, okay. Is there anything positive that I can just right now, like, I know this sucks, but here are some good things about it. And I will say there's always something that you can learn from an emotion. I mean, I had, to, I had to have a root canal once with no Novocaine. And it hurt like a son of a bitch for minutes. And the only thing I could think of was like, you know, the positive to this is I'm going to take really fucking good care of my teeth because I'm going to remember this and I don't ever want to have to do this again, right? That comes with practice. Then you think about the short and long-term consequences of your actions. So while I'm in the middle of the root canal and I'm feeling this intense pain and I'm drumming it up in my head, right? I'm not just like letting the pain happen. I'm just like, you know, okay, I could just stop right now. I could leave and then have to come back and do all of this again when I'm so close. This time with it, this time I would get the Novocaine, so that'd be nice, but then I have to, have it. so like that would be the short-term, long-term consequences. And almost always the short-term is I get relief because I'm gonna do the easy thing could be blowing up angry, could be leaving, could be spending the money, could be eating the food, could be smoking the cigarette, right? Could be cheating on your partner, could be yelling, could be quitting the class, could be not doing the homework, right? That's always, the short-term consequence is always good. It's like, I get relief. But it's the long, it's it's bringing to mind those long-term consequences that you're trading for the short-term that are, it's really challenging. And psychologists have a concept for this. They call it future discounting. So our brain perceives the value of an immediate reward, like avoiding having to do my homework, more importantly than the benefit of a long-term reward, like getting my degree. But that is a default habit that you can change if you practice reappraisal. You can also use reappraisal to effectively address positive emotional arousal. So like, let's suppose you get a job offer from a company and you really wanna work for it, but your roommate like hasn't gotten a single interview. Obviously this is a case where Rather than suppressing, right? Rather than suppressing your joy, which teaches you you're not allowed to be proud of yourself because other people's feelings might get hurt, which we do not want to reinforce. You can think to yourself like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to be there for my friend, right? To put my stuff aside for the moment so I can be there for them. It's a chance for me to practice disciplining my emotions for an outcome that I want. Short-term consequences are I don't get to brag on myself. Long-term consequences are, um, I can, I will have a chance to celebrate when I feel much better because I won't feel like my friend is being devalued.